Hello. Welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green. This is a contextualized reading for book 20 of Homer's Odyssey. For our ongoing class, uh, Homer and the Critique of Western Civilization. Uh, so uh, we left off with um, uh, Penelope going off to bed after she's met with Odysseus in disguise, of course. And uh, we know that uh, she's set up a contest for the following day. Um, uh, Odysseus has refused to have a nice bed or a change of clothes. Eurycleia has recognized him, but has um, said that she will keep her mouth shut. Uh, about it. Um, uh, book 20 is titled Portents Gather here. Um, and uh, we open on uh, Odysseus himself. Um, and uh, as Odysseus lay there plotting within himself the suitor's death, awake alert, as the women slipped from the house, the maids who hoard in the suitors' beds each night, tittering, linking arms, and frisking as before. The master's anger rose inside his chest, torn in thought, debating head and heart. Should he up and rush them, kill them one and all, or let them rut with their lovers one last time? So this is something that pisses him off. Um, uh, uh, also just, you know, in terms of like the, <laughs> the ongoing sexism and double standards that show up in this, in this textbook, just notice how, um, Odysseus's masculinity, um, makes him, you know, somehow want to control the sexual, um, behaviors of others. Um, the heart inside him growled low with rage. As a bitch mounting over her weak, defenseless puppies growly, growls facing a stranger bristling for a showdown, so he growled from his depths, hackles rising at their outrage. But he struck his chest and curbed his fighting heart. Bear up, old heart, you've borne worse than this, far worse than this. That day when the Cyclops man mountain bolted your hardy comrades down. But you held fast. Nobody but your cunning pulled, cold, pulled you through the monster's cave. You thought it would be de your death. And so I think it's an interesting invocation of the Cyclops moment there. But what the theme is going to sort of sh keep showing up here um, uh, throughout this book and, and towards the end of the text is that uh, Odysseus is able to be patient um, and to hold back and um, and restrain his feelings and um, not do what he did with the Cyclops when they were going away and he had to call back um, at the Cyclops's um, uh, name, uh, um, uh, 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 who he was. Um, uh, we get another nice simile in the next um, stanza break, the way that the Fagel's translation has it. Um, so he forced his spirit into submission. The rage in his breast reigned back, unswerving all endurance. But he himself kept tossing, turning, intent as a cook before some white-hot blazing fire who rolls his sizzling sausage back and forth, packed with fat and blood, keen to broil it quickly, tossing it, turning it, this way, that way, so he cast about. How could he get these shameless suitors in his clutches, one man facing a mob? And then Athena shows up, and she shows up as a woman sort of floating above him. Um, and Odysseus asks Athena for help. Um, he says, what if, what if I kill the suitors, thanks to you and Zeus? How do I run from... Uh, run from under their avengers show me the way so even if i could kill all of these people just me and telemachus then what happens after that how do i deal with their uh, their avengers um and um this of course um uh sets off athena and she says impossible man others are quick to trust a weaker comrade some poor mortal far less cunning than i but i am a goddess look 
Um, the very one who guards you in all of your trials to the last. I tell you this straight out, even if 50 bands of mortal fighters closed around us, hot to kill us off in battle, still you could drive away their herds with and sleek flocks. So surrender to sleep at last. Go to sleep. I've got it covered, right? It's kind of what Athena is saying. Um, but this is also why Athena loves Odysseus, right? Is because um, he's thought ahead um, to not just the immediate win against the suitors, but the Avengers, right? Um, so then Odysseus falls asleep, and as Odysseus falls asleep, Penelope wakes up. So there's this nice interplay of the dreaming going on between Penelope and Odysseus. Remember in the last book, uh, Penelope had asked Odysseus, um, the disguise did Odysseus to help her interpret a dream. So there's this dream that's connecting them um, right now in the, in the narrative. Um, so with that, Athena showered sleep across his eyes, and back to Olympus went the lustrous goddess. As soon as sleep came on him, loosening his limbs, slip, slipping the toils of anguish from his mind, his devoted wife awoke, and sitting up in her bed, returned to tears. When the queen had wept to her heart's content, she prayed to her, the huntress Artemis, first of all. And so this is this great moment, I think, for Penelope. Um, uh, she prays for Artemis to give her her death. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this passage here because um, I, I told readers to look out for it in my last um, contextualized reading. She says Artemis, uh, and, and uh, of course Artemis is not only the goddess of the hunt, but she's also, you know, famously a virgin, right? Uh, so Artemis, goddess noble of daughter Zeus, if only you'd whip an arrow through my breast and tear my life out now at once or let some whirlwind pluck me up and sweep me away along those murky paths and fling me down where the ocean river running round and the world rolls back upon itself quick as the whirlwind swept away pandarius's daughters years ago when the gods destroyed their parents leaving the girls orphans in their house but radiant aphrodite nursed them well on cheese and luscious honey and heady wine and hera gave them beauty and sound good sense more than all other women virgin artemis made them tall and athena honed their skills to fashion lovely work but then when aphrodite approached uh, olympus's peaks to ask for the girls um, uh, their crowning day as brides from Zeus who loves the lightning uh, Zeus who knows all all that's fated all not fated for mortal man then the storm spirit snatched them away and passed them on to the hateful furies yes for all their loving care and so there was an offense done to Zeus right by the parents um, here uh, and we saw Pandarius's daughters showing up in the last book. So it's a moment of compositional um, uh, foreshadowing, I think, that Homer, the narrator, um, or the poet has, has put into the previous book. But it's going to be elaborated in this particular book. And so there's the, these daughters of Pandarius um, end up becoming handmaidens of the Furies. And the Furies are, of course, set on uh, people to revenge, particularly in Greek tragedies, um, for revenge upon the, a murder done within, with, within one's own family um, system. So she's prayed for this. She's invoked the Furies. And then she says, just so. So this is a big, elaborate simile um, in Penelope's mouth. Just so may the gods who rule Olympus blot me out. Artemis, with your glossy braids, come shoot me dead, so I can plunge beneath this loathsome earth with the image of Odysseus vivid in my mind. Never let me warm the heart of a weaker man. Even grief is bearable, true, when someone weeps through the days, sobbing, heart convulsed with pain, yet embraced by sleep all night. Sweet oblivion, sleep dissolving all, the good and the bad, once it seals our eyes. But even my dreams torment me. 
sent by wicked spirits again just this night someone lay beside me like odysseus to the life when he embarked with his men at arms my heart raced with joy no dream i thought the waking truth at last at those words the narrator tells us uh, dawn rose on her golden throne in a sudden gleam of light and great odysseus caught the sound of his wife crying so then she's talking about her dreams how she's haunted in her dreams how she thought maybe somebody was laying next to her and um uh uh like her husband in the night and then uh as she um sobs that wakes odysseus back up so there's this shift and great odysseus caught the sound of his wife's cry and began to daydream deep in his heart it seems she stood beside him knew him now at last gathering up the fleece and blankets where he'd slept he laid them on a chair in the hall and he took the oxide out and spread it down lifted his hands and prayed to zeus so penelope has just invoked artemis right goddess of the hunt and staunch virgin um uh and she's asked to be shot down and Z and uh, then odysseus is going to pray to zeus and he says father zeus if you really willed it so to bring me over ho home over land and sea lanes home to native ground after all the pain you brought me show me a sign a good omen voiced by someone awake indoors another sign outside from zeus himself and at this there's a zeus sends down a thunderbolt and this great shift in image here, I think, from Homer, the narrator here, um, because um, we get a shift not only from Odysseus, who's, who's prayed this, but to this servant woman in the hall um, uh, who's grinding grain at that particular moment. Um, uh, and she let fly a lucky word, <laughs> as the text says. Close at hand she was where the good commander set handmills once and now 12 women in all performed their tasks grinding the wheat and barley marrow of the men of men's bones um marrow of men's bones is great um uh, uh the rest were abed by now they'd milled their stint this one alone the frailest of all kept on working stopping her mill she spoke an omen for her master zeus father king of gods and men now there was a crack of thunder out of the starry sky uh and not a cloud in sight sure it's a sign you're go showing someone now so poor as i am grant me my prayer as well let this be the last day the last these suitors uh, bolt their groaning feasts in a king odysseus's house these brutes who break my knees my heart-wrenching labor grinding their grain now let them eat their last and so we see that this is kind of the foreshadowing for the for the the massive revenge plot that <laughs> is um, structuring the odyssey but i just think that that shift from odysseus to the servant woman is a, is just a particularly nice touch by homer the poet um, and then we get a shift, uh, um, uh, the, um, so Odysseus heart leaps up. We get a shift to Telemachus who waking up, um, uh, is kind of like rebuking and asking Eurycleia, like, you know, so like what happened with, you know, how did you treat the, our stranger last night? Um, uh, good or bad, or, you know, did my mother treat her, um, uh, um, Oh, did my mother leave him untended? That would be my mother's way, sensible as she is, all impulse doting over some worthless stranger, turning a good man out to, to face the worst. And um, Eurycleia again kind of like counters um, Telemachus for, um, you know, spewing some bullshit. She says, please, child, um, don't blame her. Your mother's blameless this time. He sat and drank all his wine as she tells him, you know, he said he wanted to sleep on his own, that he didn't want a nice bed, that he didn't want new clothes. Um, and so hearing that, this satisfies Telemachus, and he heads out, and there's always like a pair of sleek hounds um, following him. 
Uh, and then there's a shift to the maids, Eurycleia and the maids giving orders or giving the other maids orders um, throughout the house. And at that moment, Eumaeus has shown up in the morning. And so that there's that nice shift from the, the, the kind of really trusted servants of Eurycleia to Eumaeus, the male one. And then um, he addresses Odysseus. Um, friend, do the suitors show you more respect or treat you like the dregs of the earth as always? And um, Odysseus says, good Eumaeus, if only the gods would pay back their outrage. Um, and then along comes Melanthius, right, who already had abused Odysseus and um, Eumaeus on their way to town. So he shows up again. So there's a lot of kind of paralleling working. Um, I, earlier in um, my contextualized readings, I talked about the kind of accordion dance that is going on in, in the text. And um, we see a lot of that moving back and forth uh, as well again. But the difference is, uh, um, um, again, what, what's re repeated is that Odysseus keeps silent, right? Odysseus doesn't counter back to Melanthius. Um, uh, and, and neither does Eumaeus this time either. Um, no reply, the wily one just shook his head silent, his mind churning with thoughts of bloody work. Um, and then we get a counter to Melanthius. We get this guy, um, uh, uh, Philoetius, um, uh, who greets them. He's another cowherd and he's a stranger and, and uh, or, so he greets the stranger and he is hospitable. He seems very positive. Um, and then he launches into how much he misses his master, right? So we get that theme showing up again of like the servants who love their master. Uh, my heart aches for Odysseus, my great lord and master. He set me in charge of his herds. Um, in, an, in a Cephalenian country, when I was a, just a youngster, uh, how they've grown by now, past counting. Um, and after hearing the cowherd, Odysseus answers, you're no coward, nobody's fool, I'd say. Even I can see their sense in that old head. So I tell you this, my solemn binding oath. I swear by Zeus, the first of all gods, by by the table of hospitality, right, Xenia, wait, waiting for us by Odysseus's hearth where I have come for help. Odysseus will come home while you're still here. You'll see it with your own eyes if you have the heart. These suitors who lord it here cut down in blood. And Eumaeus echoes this, and he says, like, if only this could happen. And at that moment, um, uh, it, we get a kind of shift in perspective to um, the suitors who have all gathered in the assembly space in the morning um, and they're discussing the plot on Telemachus. And there's this kind of this moment of a bird sign, right? The, um, an eagle clutching a trembling dove. We've seen that earlier on in the text. But at that moment that Odysseus has just said this um, and had this exchange with um with the cow herd and the swine herd, um, uh, then we get uh, the eagle, the bird sign coming and clutching the dove, and then the shift over to the suitors as well. So I like kind of mentioned that um, uh, I think that we're we're being <laughs> set up subtly for a sacrifice that is happening. The swine herd has come in and brought the hogs. The um, cow herd has come in and brought cows, and there's then the shift to um, the suitors themselves who are uh, uh, being figured here subtly as a kind of sacrifice. Um, uh, then uh, Telemachus, we get a shift. Um, he's advising the, stu the suitors. He says, leave Odysseus alone or the Odysseus in disguise. Um, and then, of course, we get a counter from Antinous, who's always um, standing up. Um, uh, he says, fighting words, but um, do let's knuckle under to our prince. Such abuse, such naked threats. But clearly Zeus has foiled us, our lo or long before we would have shut his mouth um, for him in the halls, fluent and flowing as he is. So he mocked. 
but Telemachus paid no heed. So there's this mirroring between Telemachus and Odysseus at this point is kind of showing their minds in sync that they're letting the abuses be hurled at them, um, but they're not doing anything about it. Then the text tells us that, um, that this is a sacrifice that's going to happen for Apollo's feast day. Um, and so that's particularly important, I think, um, here as well. Um, we've seen a servant woman doing the grain part. Um, we know that the suo, suwe torilia ceremony that will eventually become more formalized with the Romans, where it's the sacrifice of a sheep or goat, um, a pig, and a bull. Um, that that is going to be associated with grain harvests as well. So all of that imagery is really surrounding um, uh, the, the moments here. And it's also important, I think, that we get Apollo's feast as well, because Apollo has not been a god that has shown up a lot throughout the Odyssey so far as well. So um, I think that that's something worth pondering on and, and thinking about what's going on symbolically here. Um, uh, because as we get this shift, um, uh, after Telemachus, um, uh, uh, then counters Antinous, um, uh, um, another one steps in, another suitor steps in, um, um, uh, Ctesippus insults, then steps in and insults Odysseus. Um, uh, do, going directly. And we're told by the text that Athena is in, kind of inspiring the suitors here um, to, to not listen to Telemachus. So she's kind of ramping up all of the emotions. Um, and uh, so then Telemachus rebukes as well, and he goes, in, in, he goes into kind of a rage here in this kind of speech um, where he lays in um, and he says, you can thank your lucky stars you missed our guest because um, Ctesippus um, has uh, thrown, hur hurled the hoof of, uh, um, fr from a tray at Odysseus, and Odysseus has dodged it. Um, you can thank your lucky stars, you missed our guest. He ducked, the, your, he ducked your blow by God, else I would have planted my sharp spear in your bowels. Your father would have been busy with your funeral, not your wedding here. Enough. Don't let me more of uh, see more offense in my house. So Telemachus is claiming his house, right? Not from anyone. I'm alive to it all now. The good and the bad. The boy you knew is gone, but I still bear the, must bear with this, this lovely sight. Sheep flocks butchered, wine swilled, food squandered. How can a man fight so many single-handed? But no more of your crimes against me, please unless you're bent on cutting me down now, and I'd rather die, yes, better by that by far than have to look on your outrage day by day, guests treated by, to blows, men dragging the ser serving women through our noble house, exploiting them, all no shame. So again, the image of of, of sexual conduct going on. But here it's framed not in terms of the women being whores, as was happened um, earlier, but now they are the victims of the suitors. And the response here, the text tells us, is dead quiet. The suitors all fell silent. And then the master son, Agalus, um, uh, says, Fair enough, my friends, when a man speaks well, we have no grounds for wrangling, no cause for abuse. Hands off the stranger. And then he says to Telemachus to go sit in, with your mother and coax her to wed the best man here, um, the one who offers the most so you can have and hold your father's estate, eating and drinking here, your mind at peace while the mo your mo mother plays the wife in another house. So this acknowledgement that's happening subtly throughout the text that um, uh, the estate is does belong to Telemachus and he's become a man and he um, is taking charge of his own place. Um, but then Athena again urges, makes the, the um, suitors laugh um, uh, uh, as Telemachus says, I swear by Ju Zeus um, Agalus 
um, by all my, my father suffered dead, no doubt, or wandering far from Ithaca these days. I don't delay my mother's marriage. I press her to marry the one that she wants, but I'm not going to drive her from my own house and unwilling um, uh, again. And so this makes the suitors laugh or Athena uh, makes them laugh um, uncontrollably. And Theoclymenus sees this as terror. So I think this is important because I think this is um, when we're thinking back on Apollo and Apollo's feast day that we've seen portents and we're also seeing some a lot more interpretation going on of some of the signs um, and question there's been these um, questions the night before about the dream and dream interpretation as well this is all going on um, subtly um, behind the scenes and so Theoclymenus remember who Telemachus has brought back, so this is his guest, um, then goes to, to interpret this. And he, he sees, as all of the men are sort of like um, uncontrollably laughing at Telemachus, he sees this as them, uh, uh, as, as showing their also the terror on their faces because there's something that he knows is going to happen, that they're all going to die. Um, and so he interprets it as such. And this causes even more laughter from uh, the suitors. Um, at that, they all broke into peals of laughter aimed at the seer, Polybus's son, Eurymachus, braying first and foremost. And remember, at other times in the text, Eurymachus has been the greatest of the suitors, right? Our guest, just in from abroad, the man is raving. Quick, my boys, hustle him out of the house into the meeting grounds, the light of day. Everything here he thinks is dark as night. And Theoclymenus says, I can get out just w uh, fine by myself, right? And, uh, you know, he says, these things are going to happen. And he, you know, probably <laughs> very soberly and, and, and of good mind um, goes out uh, because he knows what's going to happen um, or he's seen what's going to happen. With that, he marched out of the sturdy house and went home to Piraeus, the host who had warned him in. Um, but the laughter here that um, the suitors are, are giving is at Telemachus, that not only um, is Telemachus not really the man he claims himself to be, but he's gone off into the world and uh, he's come back and he's brought this old man beggar stranger as his guest, and then this seer whom they don't believe um, uh, as well. And so this is what seems lesser to them um, in their eyes. Uh, uh, and so the, the advice of one of the suitors just here at the end, take it from me, you'll be better by off by far to toss your friends in a slave ship. Pack them off to Sicily fast, they'll catch you one sweet price. And the narrator tells us here at the end, so Homer, um, says, and all the while Icarius' daughter, wise Penelope, had placed her carved chair within earshot at the door so she could catch every word they uttered in the hall laughing rowdily men prepared their noonday meal succulent rich they'd butchered uh, quite a herd but as for supper what could be less enticing than what a goddess and powerful man would spread before them soon a groaning feast for they'd been first to plot their vicious crimes so this is important. This shows up at the end, and it's really interesting how it, it finally shows up directly from uh, the narrator, the poet himself, um, who's just saying, like, just you wait to see what's going to happen next. And we will see what happens next with our next contextualized reading. Uh, but this one is done for now. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you have a great uh, morning afternoon, evening, wherever and whenever you are. Uh, carry on with us and support us on Patreon if you get a chance. Follow us on YouTube. Um, thanks a lot.